Right. Well, hi, Emma and Richard from Emma Rich Productions. Uh, we're here today to talk about. Dead Ringer. Dead Ringer. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you like this film? Can you tell us a little bit about Dead Ringer? Go on, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Dead Ringer. Uh, best way to describe it is modern day Prince and the Pauper. Um, we kind of, back in when we did Dangerous Game, we, uh, me and Amar were talking and we sort of had this idea of doing a movie based on um, conspiracy theories. And one that I've always remembered growing up is um, the Beatles conspiracy theory where uh, John Lennon died in a car crash and has been, not John Lennon, sorry, Paul McCartney died in a car crash and was replaced by a lookalike. And we sort of thought about it and thought, why has that never been made into a film? And we've expanded on that. OK, you replace somebody, but you've got to take over their whole life. And that's basically what Dead Ringer is. It's this guy takes over this life to become a pop star, but he doesn't realise all the other elements that go with that. Good and the bad. Yeah. Hey, did you both write the film together? Uh, no, I wrote, wrote the film. Um, and at the first, I was a bit nervous about it. Passed it on to Amar and said, "What do you think?" Oh, I loved it. I couldn't put it yeah. down. <laughs> hey, you know, when you sit in and watch reading a script and you don't want to put it down, that's the film we're making. So, what was the, you, you've, you've written the script? What, what was the next the next stage to getting the film made? The next step is Richard saying, "Go and find the money to me." <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, that's what I do, you know. I, um, I was, you know, being an independent filmmaker is the hardest probably bit about the whole thing for me is finding the money as a producer. So, call people we know, speak to anyone who's got some money and borrow favours and see, see, you know, a network. a network of people who we can raise and, you know, do some pitching, do some dinners, take people out to some fancy restaurants and uh, hopefully get some money off them, really. Show them the dream. <laughs> That's it, and then obviously the dream's coming out on September 17th. And um, yeah. where's the premiere going to be? It's in 17th September in Leicester Square. So how, how did you guys actually get together in the first place? Well, I was making a film called Retribution in 2015, and um, Richard's previous history before he directed was an editor. So I hired Richard as an editor, loved his work, and then he approached me and said, let's make a film together which was Dangerous Game, and within four months we had it made. So quick to screen in four months. That is a quick turnaround. Really quick turnaround. So for us, it's just we've got a good partnership. I, we don't cross wires. He's the creative, I'm the business. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we might step over, but generally we leave we each other to be. Roles. We know our yeah. roles, and that's why we can crack on and make films and, you know, just yeah. keep doing them. You also act as well. I do it indeed, Jess. Do you enjoy doing that or acting is my passion yeah to be honest with you i started the actual producing side of things because i wasn't getting the roles i wanted i was getting your typical terrorist roles your corner shops your you know whatever i was getting and for that for me it wasn't enough you know i've got that motivation and drive where i want to go somewhere and i thought let's make a film so i made a film a long time ago for a very low budget and i thought this is not bad you know it's it's done all right so let's just increase the budget and every time we're doing that so in the end. Every, every yeah, every film we are, we are getting yeah. bigger budgets, you know. And for us, we purposefully don't touch on Asian or urban or black, white issues. All the characters could be played by anybody. And in fact, quite often, we often swap out male for female roles. Totally. Because we, we want the film to be colourless, if that makes sense. Um, and have people from all walks of life understand them, you know? Yeah. We don't have to have a generic person. A lot of films do that these, these days and get only a certain type of people. And for us, I want everyone and everyone involved. And this film's a collaborative medium. I want everyone to be involved. Anyone who wants an opportunity, I'm more than happy to give them that opportunity. Do you find it sometimes hard mixing the two together, you know, in front of the screen and behind the screen? very, very hard, you know, because I'm producing it and a lot of the weight is on my shoulder to make sure the money's there, make sure the location's sorted, make sure the cast are on time. And yeah, I do have people behind me helping me out, but a lot of it is on my head. So yeah, it does cause a lot of issues, but you know, that's what that's what having a good director is, keep being patient <laughs> with me and learning my lines and making sure I remember them. So Absolutely. that's basically it. In an ideal world where money was no object, what, what you could do one or the other, what, what would you do? Truthfully, I'll be an actor, because that is my passion but I think I found my feet as a, as a producer and I'm 
good at what I do. So I probably w- yeah, I play a big problem. So and I'm good at getting things done, and you know. I won't say I'm a Dell boy, but I'm, I would say I'll get things done, whatever needs to be done. Yeah, you have to have, as a producer, you have to have a knack to get the right deal, you know. Um, to, uh, we've, we've got a phrase in the, uh, in the film, actually, never pay the ticket price, and that's, that's <laughs> a nod to Amar and how he is. You know, he'll go out there and he'll find me things that basically uh, nobody else could get me. We've got three million pound penthouses in this movie. This is a low budget British indie <coughs> film, and we filmed for three days in a three million pound penthouse in Stratford. We've got stretch Ferraris, we've got private yachts, private jets, we've got all the lavish lifestyle things that any pop star would naturally have to sell that world. And if it wasn't for his talents, I wouldn't have that to play with. So, so yeah, we had all the toys on this one. So you, are you open up to what? Obviously, you're a talented uh, producer that, that could do the business. Then, are you open up to to working with other people in the future? Of course. Listen, you know, I'd, I'm at a stage right now. Where I love making my own things, but obviously, if if uh, a studio approached us and said, "Guys, come and make this film for us," it's a no-brainer because number one, the money's there. Number two, it opens our horizons to different territories which we've probably not even looked at, and we get we get you know we get more time to make the film. Mm-hmm. I get a lot more. It probably will be harder, but it wouldn't be because the time with a short, low budget film, we've got to shoot this in four, five, six weeks and get everything wrapped because we haven't got the money to go any further. Okay. Some of this film was shot in America, is that right? It was, yeah, it was shot in Florida and Los Angeles and UK. What sort of obstacles does that throw up shooting in America? We were very fortunate really because I met the actual, in Florida, I met the Florida Film Commissioner for the actual area where we wanted to film. And he helped me out a lot, actually. He actually gave me a lot of guidance. And I met him in Cairns, and he was like, come and shoot your movie here. So it was a lot easier than I thought. I've got a lot of background in Florida myself. I've always had a family home there. My dad used to sell properties there when I was younger, so I've been going to Florida a lot when I was little. So for me, it was a home away from home to shoot at. In LA, it was a lot different. We just literally winged it. We we hired some lights from out there. Booked the studio. Booked the studio. Uh, booked other locations. Got the actors. Literally in did a Did it how we would do it here, but there. And sometimes that's not the best way to do it, if, especially if you're not, not a native. But, you know, it worked. it worked. We got there, it worked. Sometimes you just do have to just jump in and do it. Thinking about it, planning it, thinking about what all the problems are. Sometimes that doesn't help. It does, just do it. Nike says just do it, so we just do it, get on with it and don't wait around. So what's the thing you're most proud of that you've pulled off in this movie then? On a low-budget movie, you're thinking, man, mate, we've pulled that off. The whole film, basically. I mean, I don't think anybody could put a value on what's on screen. Um, It's very important to both of us that what you see on the screen is all the money we had and that you see something and go, wow, if, if I was going to make that, I would estimate that was one, two, three, four million pound movie. I'm not going to tell you what the budget was, but it wasn't that. Um, and that's what we're proud of, because we've achieved something that I don't think any other independent filmmaker could do. Um, on top of that, it's a great story, it's good fun, and it's great entertainment. We've got a good cast attached, you know? We've got some good, good names from America, from here, and... I think the whole thing as a whole, you know, there's nothing that stands out per se, but the whole film itself, when it comes out, I think everyone will see for a very, very micro-budget film, we've pulled out all the stops, definitely. Can we talk about your next film? Of course you can. Which is going to be, is it the first time you've done a horror? It, yeah. From, yeah, it is. First both time. Of both of you. Yeah, both of us. Yeah. Yeah. And it's called Seven, I believe. It's called The Seven, yeah, go on, Rich. <laughs> the Seven. The Seven, yeah. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> okay, so... When we go to the film markets, we often get um, a sort of guided by distributors about what's popular at the moment and so on. And one of the things that kept coming up was, oh, have you ever done a horror? Have you ever done a horror? And we thought, well, OK, maybe it's time we should do a horror then. Um, but we didn't want to do the traditional British horror, which is sort of a stab f- fest, if you like. Blood, lots of blood and, and girls. That's not us. That We knew that early on. 
we wanted to do your more American horror with the teenage kids, a bit like a Scooby-Doo film for adults, if you like, where they're, they're all running around a college, they're all scared out of their wits, and you don't quite know what the ghost or the spook or what the, the ghoul is. Um, so we came up with this idea of these seven kids getting locked in a college one night, and there is this thing hunting them down and picking them off one by one. So that's, that's the basic premise of the seven. But we've got some big stars in there. We've got Dave Courtney. And I co-produced it with Dean Kane. For me, that was a you know, godsend, really, you know, from going from producing things myself to now actually getting another A-list producer attached. I think that will definitely excel us to the next level. Did that make it feel a lot easier for you? It was easier to get people on board, number one, and work on the film. Probably film in LA, which we done for that film as well, so that was a lot easier for us. But just having someone else there named by my side, it does help a lot. Yeah. Dave Court is a big, large, and large character, as I'm sure he did in the degree himself. Um, what's it like working with Dave? Dave's a gentleman. I've known him for a long time. You know, I call him Uncle Dave, so it's not like a working relationship. I can have a laugh with him, I can have fun with him, but when it comes to work, he does do his work. He learns his lines, he gets it on point, and... Well, and this right. was a different kind of role for him. This wasn't the traditional gangster role that everybody's seen him in. He plays a different character. He's still Dave Courtney. You'll still, the fans of Dave Courtney will still recognise him and like him. But this was, I wouldn't say a challenge, but it was something different for him. He wanted to do this and he put everything into it. And yeah, uh, People have often sort of criticised um, somebody like that, that they go, oh, they're not a, a great actor, maybe they haven't got the lines right, maybe. Because he wanted to do this, the performance he gave in this is, is phenomenal. People will love it. There's a great, great scene towards the end of the movie where he kind of explains everything that's gone on. <clears throat> and it was about four pages of dialogue and he didn't get one line wrong once in all the takes we did. So hats off to him, really good actor. So when are you expecting The Seven to be released? Looking for The Seven, I'd like to say June next year. You know, it gives us a bit of time to promote it and get things done. We're taking it to the American film market in November to get a sales agent and... And then it'll be in their hands, so they'll decide yeah, the They'll decide the date, stuff. so really, I can say I'd like to have it in June, but really, once it goes to a sales agent or distributor, it's out of our control. It just goes whenever they want, so... Is it ever hard lo losing control of your movie? Oh, of course. Yeah, 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 I mean, that's the biggest learning curve for me. I've always worked for other people on other people's productions. Um, and you always think that, oh, yeah, well, when I get to do my movie, I'll choose to do this, I'll choose like to that. do that. And it's so not like that. You you make your movie, you make it the way you want it, yes. But the moment it's made, all the other decisions, the artwork for the posters. Oh, the posters are a big states. thing, you know, that's, that's going to sell in supermarkets, online, iTunes, Sky. But we've got to pitch what we want, but really, it's entirely up to distribute what goes on that shelf. Because posters can be very misleading, DVD. You know, totally. Sometimes you see people yeah. with uh, actors, they've got a gun in their hand, machine gun in their hand, and there's, and there's not even a gun in the film. Of course, but that's uh, the old British distributors. They've got that gangster way, and that gets into supermarkets. That's what they're used to, and that's how they sell things. But I feel like times are changing now. People are making their right. own things, putting their own things on Amazon and iTunes themselves, and that is a big change in the industry, hence why the DVD market has dropped sufficiently and the TV and digital market is on the boom, so... Do you think DVD is, is finished or there will, will always be a, a DVD it's, market? There's a, that's, a, that's a big discussion. Um, I think there is there are still people that like having a physical copy of something. That's why vinyl made a comeback. Um, but the numbers have dropped. And whether they'll ever pick up again, probably not. It's too easy to sit at home and press a button on your remote control. So easy. And get, get whatever you want up. And it costs the same as going to the cinema as well. So a lot of people finding it easier just to put it on digital alone. A lot of films are doing it and skipping the DVD route. Because manufacturing DVD, copyright, everything 
it costs money and people are thinking, do I want to spend that if I'm not going to sell several thousands of DVDs, you know? It is a risk on DVD as well, so the easiest thing is probably put it on iTunes, put it on digital platforms and just pray that people download it. Do you put anything on Amazon Prime or is it all paid for view? No, it is on Amazon Prime as well. Yeah. Um, How'd you find that? Yeah, it's, 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 it does all right, but still they pay you pennies for nothing, really, so you've got to make sure you've got a big, 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 big fan base or a big audience ready to go. I think that's the, that's the big misconception from the audience's point of view. They think that the money makers are the filmmakers. Um, it's not. It's the, the, it's the two ends, really. It's the financers and it's the distributors. They're the ones, if there's a huge profit made in a movie, they're the ones that get it all first. It then filters down to the filmmakers way, way after. <laughs> Way, way. <laughs> and that's, this, and sometimes that sticks in the back of your throat because you're like, gosh, I'm really just doing this now for the love of it. But um, but you love it, so you do it. So. But then it is a business, so yeah, we've got to make we'll sure make that work. we're going to make it work and carry on making films and, you know, you just need that one hit. Um, what's next? More films, more films, anything, more. Anything penned? Or? Yeah, we've got 18 scripts in the library, if you like, that we've got ready to go. Um, as I say, when we go to these film markets, we get guided what to do next, and we'll go, what fits that? We'll look through our library of stuff that we've written. Tweak it. Tweak it, fit fit the roles, etc. Um, and hopefully we can carry on making, you know, at least a film a year. That's the aim, minimum a film a year, and. If we can do two a year, we'll churn them out. It just totally depends on what the market wants. For example, La La Land come out, so everyone goes to us, make a musical. That's nothing I'll do myself, but I can understand why they want that. Horror films are in right now, so we made one. So as long as it goes out at the right time, right place, surely it should be a hit. So it's just it's just a just a guessing game, making a film, doing a quality film, and hope hoping for the best. Really it is but we're not going to be singing, seeing you singing a musical. You never know, mate. You never know. You never know. <laughs> if it come to it, I'll still do it. <laughs> um, is there anything that you'd like to talk about that you'd like to get out there at all? Yeah, for me, it's a big thing for me is obviously, uh, as you know, low-budget independent filmmakers, we don't have the backing from the studio, which is the biggest thing people forget. They see all our stuff on social media because I'm constantly putting things, pushing the film on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, any way I possibly can, because it's free. And I don't think a lot of people understand, whether it's people in the film, people not in the film, public, that we need that support. We cannot sell this and make it a success without other people pushing the film, buying it, the pushing it. The public don't know the film exists, they just simply don't, they don't know, know about it. it. So we need to push it, we just want everyone's support to push everything we do, because that's the only way we make it a success. The actors have become successful, we as producers and directors have become successful. And that's the biggest thing for me is people need to understand that we haven't got the millions of pounds. You know, on a normal studio film, they'll spend 100 million making the film, but then another 100 million promoting it, which people forget we don't have. Yeah. We're doing it all ourselves. Doing interviews, doing leaflet dropping our flyers to places and making people put stuff on social media. It's a, it's a difficult ride, but you know, that's, that's what we've got to do. And if we want to be successful, we've just got to make sure people back us and, and so if help us push can it. And share or they see something, it takes a second to share it, but it means the world to us. It really does. Who do you get to do your artwork? We have different companies. Usually <coughs> distributors do the artwork. Yeah. So whoever, whoever distribution company we go with, they, right, they, they, take it they do it. And they do, it's all in their hands. If yeah. you, if, if you, um, you know, I come to you, I say, right, there's 10 million quid, go and make a, make a film. Yeah. What would that film be? I would say action straight away. I don't know what yeah. Richard's for. Probably an action film. An action movie uh, with an A-lister star um, heading it up. And we'd probably take it along the lines of, well, we've actually got one written, actually, called uh, The Infiltrators. And it's basically the British Taken. So it's, it's uh, with a twist. There's a huge twist in the story. But it'd be that kind of movie, I think. It's a dream. Uh, action movies is something that we do we do struggle with in the British film industry. Don't we? You know, we, we do punch it above our weight, but action is something that does take a lot of money. Absolutely. Um, 
it, it does need to change, doesn't it? It does, but yeah. then, you know, you can do your... If you're good at fighting, you do your martial arts, your stunts, but that's not enough anymore. Yeah. People want to see Car chases, Hummers yeah. being blown up yeah, and explosions. helicopters, explosions, yeah. and Fast and Furious have set another level in this. And people try and compare. We have to try and compete with those people. So if someone gave me 10 million, I think we'll do a good job of it. Yeah, so you, the thing is, the audience is, if you see two DVDs on the shelf, Fast and the Furious or Dead Ringer, and both within the same sort of price range as each other, they don't know what was spent behind those two movies. They don't go, oh, well, that's a multi-million pound studio picture. Yeah. That's an independent British movie that, that had a portion of, of what the other one had to spend on it. I might give it a try, but the price tag isn't involved in their decision. What's involved is who's in it and whether it's the kind of film, the genre that they like. Um, the point being that we often lose out because we don't have those budgets. But we'll get there, eventually we'll get them. And then when we do, we can make those bigger movies because we now know the formula, we now know what we need. But certain things still cost money, the big A-list of names the big locations, the, the big, big stunts. stunts. Those three are the biggest things. Once we've got those, it's, it's, it's simple. We've got that formula collect and we can make the film within six months. And the speed thing, if people are sort of thinking about the speed, the speed thing for us is, is quite key for our investors. A lot of people make movies and will take one year, two years, three years before it gets completed. But if you invested in a a normal investment, a bank, property, whatever, and your money took three, four years to come back, as an investor, you'd probably be quite upset. So what we try to do is to look after our investors, is make the movie quicker. And we get the money back to them quicker that way, and then they may reinvest. So it's not about not taking any care over the product, it's about knowing that we can do that, so we will do that. We could got to speak to a point, as I said, it's just a formula pre filming the movie in production. And post. Do your film see a return? Yeah, mm. every they're single they're one they're of them. Profitable, yeah? Yes. Yeah. Always. What film is it you're most proud of? Probably both different, I guess, aren't they? You know, my one, it's my baby, was Gangsters, Gamblers, and Geezers, because I wrote it, directed it, produced it, done it all from the ground up to seeing, seeing it do well. For me, that was my baby. Quality wise, probably not so much. But as a whole, that film, but quality, I'd say Dead Ringer surpasses anything we've done. It's unbelievable and I'm so proud of it. I can't yeah. wait for it to come out. I can only echo that Dead Ringer for me. Dangerous Game was great. It was my first solely directed picture. Um, and obviously that will always have a, a sense of pride in my heart for that. Cool. But Dead Ringer uh, will knock everybody's socks off. People will not. <laughs> I will not believe what's coming. Even the people in it don't even know what's coming. That's the thing. Because no one's seen the film as yet. No, no test screens. I'm, I've done a few in, we done one in uh, America. Yeah. We, we went to the premiere in America, that was really good, but that was Standing just the people. at the end, which was great. And that was a different so. crowd to what the film is, a British film at the end of the day, you know, so if they got it. They respond to the British accents. They loved it, they got everything, yeah. you know. Yeah. They. We've even got an English actor playing an American cop and they even liked his accent, so we got away with that. <laughs> and is it released in America at the same time? It won't be, no, it'll be a month later. Right. So do you want to tell us um, when, when the film is going to be released, Dead Ringer? Yeah, it's on September the 17th, on the day of the premiere, available in all the good shops, outlets and uh, Sky Store, iTunes, Amazon, basically every digital platform possible. And not just for us, but for every independent filmmaker out there. Please, please, please buy it from a legitimate source because otherwise our industry will die and we need to keep it going. You know, downloading from copied sites and so on, it, it's killing us. It is absolutely killing us and it's the biggest threat to the independent film industry totally. at the moment. Is that... You know, obviously the the big studios get done uh, with copy, uh, you know, with um, black market. 
um, yeah. down, illegal downloads and all that. Do, is, does it really affect you as well? Massively. We, yeah. you know, I can. I went on a website once just to watch, just to see. Obviously, you do your own research, and over two hundred thousand people have watched it on that website. My movie, and I'm thinking two hundred thousand people. This was a long time ago, and I thought. If that wasn't there, those people were watching it and paying for it, and you know, could it does affect you, could us. Could you do anything to get that taken down? Well, you do, but you, have you to, do, but, but you that's have a to. full-time job. Chasing that alone, you can need be a ten people job. working and getting off every website, and for that, that costs money, and which we haven't got. So we've just got to, you know, push it, and hopefully people buy it in the right way and watch it in the right way. If you love film, buy it the right way. Absolutely, couldn't agree more. Well, guys, it's been great talking to you. Thank and, you very much. Uh, best Good of luck with the uh, film. Appreciate it. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing it. Cheers. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs>